Find it. Tax yours at gov.uk slash dvla slash tax it now. Remember, tax it or lose it. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten, top of the morning to you. And thank you for choosing LBC this morning. You can do the heavy lifting, actually, because I'm joined in the studio by Lisa Nandy, the Labour leadership contender. I have a, a pristine switchboard in front of me. It's like it's like a lawn the morning after it has snowed. If you would like to uh, put your footprints upon it, then ring 0345 973 right now, and you can put your questions to, um, I hope you, well, we'll find out. Can I describe you as the surprise package in the Labour leadership candidate, or, or, or would that not be fair? What on earth does that mean? Well, it means that, well, I read <laughs> that when you started on the stump for this uh, for this job, you had the air of somebody who was doing it for the right reasons, but perhaps not in expectation of winning. And then about two, three weeks in, uh, it has been suggested that, 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 that something changed, and you began to have the air of, of, of a woman who thought she could actually win this thing. So it's definitely true that I haven't been planning this for years. I didn't start plotting the path to power at nine years old and I haven't spent the last couple of years trying to become the leader of the Labour Party. I, I've actually spent the last couple of years trying to deal with the huge problems in parts of the world like mine in Wigan mm. um, where people have felt that Labour's moving away from them for a very long time and where we saw this complete collapse at the election. But um, it's not true to say that I didn't come into this to win it i did actually and i don't believe in standing in leadership contests to broaden the debate i think you can broaden the debate by being in politics we've all got a massive platform to do that and it's a great privilege i came into it to win because i genuinely think unless the labor party changes we'll die and we'll deserve to um why did the labor party do so badly in december uh, well, two things came up constantly on the doorsteps, Brexit and Jeremy, but actually behind that is a much longer set of trends that have uh, seen us losing support um, in working class communities in the North, the Midlands, North Wales, the South um, and parts of Scotland for a very long time. People just don't feel that we're for them. They don't feel that we get it, that we have as much riding on it as they do, that we understand their lives or that we are prepared to do anything about the very real problems that they have. And we've got to we've got to sort that out because actually I've been living and representing the, my friends and neighbours in Wigan for the last 10 years, and they are right. Well, they're right, except perhaps including the point where you acknowledge, because you have to, that, that everything you've just said is probably true, but none of it explains why they would think that the Conservative Party had the answers to these questions. That, I mean, there's almost a parallel reality here. There's the uh, uh, Labour analysis, which is about not being trusted or, or not feeling represented or not feeling... Um, but they all, a lot of them went and vote, voted for the Tories, not least perhaps because so many of Jeremy Corbyn's core support told them to f off and do so if they if they couldn't see the the messianic status of the of the current leader. Yeah, I'm not. Sure. I mean, I definitely think the nastiness in the Labour Party and the divisions and the infighting played a part in what happened. But I don't think people pay that much attention, to be honest. If you're not on Twitter, you don't notice most of this stuff. And, and most you, of you the country aren't. Before we came on air, that you're not on Twitter. No, you, you, so, uh, you've had a kind of purge of social media. I have I've taken it off my phone, which means I'm sort of slightly clueless about some of the things that people keep asking me about in the Westminster bubble but it right. is a lovely place to be I think to be honest if you start thinking that all of that is real that's where you get into real problems and that has been a bit of a problem for the left in recent years is that we spend a lot of time in this sort of hot house of social media particularly Twitter yes. when most of the country if they are on social media seems to be on Facebook and we talk amongst ourselves and we think that we're doing well when we're not and we think we're doing badly when we're not and we just haven't learned how to understand the public and we, we should be out there amongst the public if we really want to understand what's happening. So what do you offer that's different from the other candidates I, I suspect if Rebecca Long Bailey deigned to come in and take calls as you have done and as, as Jess Phillips did before she pulled out of the um, uh, of the campaign people will be looking for clear blue water between you yeah I think that's probably right I mean you know I didn't come into the contest to differentiate myself from the other candidates I came in because I think I spent the last 10 years warning that what has just happened to Labour was about to happen trying to do something about it trying to work out how we, en we can, again, speak for very, very different parts of the country with very different experiences in recent decades. You know, in London, where I used to be a councillor um, in Hammersmith, we had huge problems with inequality, lots of growth, but 
kids that I represented who were completely shut out from that, who were growing up in poverty, who were dealing with knife crime, which was an issue even then um, and is much worse now. And yet in parts of the world like Wigan, where my family are and where I live, what we've seen is 40 years of economic decline and the collapse of the local economy in many of those places, uh, infrastructure leaving, young people leaving, the spending power not there anymore, so the high street falls apart, and just a sense that nobody is interested and nobody is coming to help. I'm, I'm going to push you once more on, on, on a question I've already asked you, and then we'll hit the phone. So um, if you want to put something to Lisa and Andy yourself, 0345 6060 is the number you need. I'm still not clear, and it's quite possible that you're not either, which is perfectly excusable, the, 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 where the line is between explaining why Labour has failed and understanding how people have been persuaded to vote Conservative instead, because the Conservatives yeah. aren't offering a meaningful answer to any of the problems no, I agree. that you've and described, and I don't think their staunchest supporter would claim that they were. I, I agree, but I, you know, in the election campaign I campaigned all over the place and in all of those places I didn't feel any real enthusiasm or affection for the Tories or for Boris Johnson okay. when I went to Ashfield three days after the election result just to talk to Labour voters to listen to them and just to former Labour voters and to understand it one of the ex-miners that I met I said to him how could you possibly have voted Tory after everything they've done to us and he said it's not about them it's about you right and that that was the flavour I got the morning after. And they, we... want, they want Labour to come home to them. Right. There is a moment, a small window, where they are willing to consider us again, but we've got to show that we've understood it, we've listened, and have the humility to go out there and take it on the chin. And that's that. you asked me what's different about me in this contest. Mm. That's what I've been doing. I've spent most of my time out with the public, not just talking to members, asking for their votes, but out with the public, understanding this, giving them a voice, and showing that we've got it and that we'll change. Jim Pickard, the FT's got hold of Labour's official report into its worst electoral defeat for 80 years. Do, do, do you see how it looks to the ex-miner that you just talked of when, when the two election coordinators, Andrew Gwynn and Ian Lavery, <laughs> conduct a report which concludes Jeremy Corbyn should be exonerated for the worst Labour performance since 1935? Well, I, I haven't seen the report, but I think none of us can be exonerated for the worst election defeat since 1935. I and mean, we got it badly wrong on all sorts of issues, Brexit being one, where we accepted the idea that you pick a side mm. and you fight it out until one side has won and the other side has been defeated. And actually, friends who... Well, I d I, well look, we're going to take calls, because I would pick you up on that, so you didn't pick a side, and that was the Problem, well, I don't think that's true, actually. I think that we we managed to hit the sweet spot where Remainers thought we were Leavers and Leavers thought we were Remainers. In 2017, and all over the country, we're just losing hand right, over fist. Well, <clears throat> it's not about me, it's about you, and it's about the callers. David is in Enfield to kick things off. You pop your headphones on, Lisa, thank you. David, what would you like to ask Lisa and Andy? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, my question was about the focus of the campaign. Uh, I thought that to Jeremy Corbyn, if we could put, approach the campaign the right way, had the biggest... Uh, own goal in recent political history because um, I feel the focus should have been on the um, basically the economy and the effects austerity was having on the living standards, particularly of your voters in the uh, in, in the northern cities and the Midlands. He, he makes a valid because point. I suppose it all gets drowned out by "get Brexit done," doesn't it? In retrospect, that that was the slogan that defined the election. It, but but why didn't why did why, why didn't it, you campaign more on on reversing austerity? Well, we we did. I mean, that was the entire focus of the campaign. But strangely, I think that the more that we talked about the way in which public transport was falling apart, the way in which the NHS was in crisis and social mm. care was unresolved and rough sleepers were back on the streets the more people thought yes you're right and that's why we've got to get Brexit done and so the more that we campaigned on austerity the more powerful that Boris Johnson slogan became and I felt like grow over the course of the campaign and that was really I think you know to go back to the earlier conversation that you might have heard James and I having in the studio that was the problem with where we'd ended up on Brexit is that because we wouldn't mm. count doing a deal because we didn't work hard enough to try and bring both sides together and speak for both we ended up in this situation where people didn't trust that if we were elected that Brexit would be resolved and so they didn't trust that actually we could then turn to dealing with the things mm. that really matter mm. to them uh, and uh, I, I think the next question will be about Brexit David thank you apologies for the shortness of time but I'm cracking on I'll just read this Pete's been in touch to say great point by Lisa about social media and Twitter although she obviously won't see this <laughs> supportive post <laughs> well I've heard it now Thanks very much. Chris is in Twickenham. Chris, what would you like to ask Lisa and Andy? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, I, I'm looking at who to vote for in the um, coming uh, 
election for the new leader. And Me. I'm quite liking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I'm quite liking you know, the way you're coming across on many on many fronts. And I thought your um, interview with uh, Andrew Neil the other night um, on TV was I thought you dealt with exceedingly well. Um, and I can see you working very well at the dispatch box against Mr. Johnson. Um, my only concern really is about Brexit, unfortunately, um, which is that uh, I know you voted to remain in the 2016 referendum um, and that you've since, um, and your, 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 um, your electorate voted to, to leave. Um, but what concerns me is why it was that you feel, or I assume anyway since then, that you feel somehow that them having their way by leaving the EU um, will give them a better prospect than if they'd um, if we'd remain in the EU and you you tried to convince them that that was the right thing to be doing. Mm. This, this is the crux of British politics at the moment. Whatever people might think is going to happen on Friday, this is going to define us for, for, for at least five years, quite possibly more, in that people like you have to somehow respect the result of the referendum now that there's no prospect of reversing it, while presumably still believing that the, the, the good burgers of Wigan have, have voted to harm their own futures, to damage their own livelihoods. Well, two, two thirds of people voted to leave in yes. Wigan, but don't forget a third also voted to remain, and I'm their MP too. True. And I've, you know, I was one of them, and I've been defending them as well ever since and arguing that they ought to have a stake. I suppose the answer to your question really is that I was in the shadow cabinet when the referendum happened. I thought we would lose it because I could feel what was happening in parts of the country mm. like mine. Um, I was. Do people I believe you? Because I. I did as well, oddly, just doing no, this for a living. No. I, I said to people, no, 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 it's really not. People, <laughs> people kept telling me, in the words of one of the leaders of the Remain campaign, London will save you. Yeah. And um, so quite happy to just ignore the fact that there was this yeah. growing anti-EU sentiment in other parts of the country, just as long as we got across the line. And I spent most of the time just campaigning in places like Redcar in Sunderland. I went up to the Nissan factory where the workers <laughs> there were voting to leave and the management were tearing their hair out. And I suppose I just went through this process that a lot of the country is now going through three years earlier because I felt the strength of feeling there and I knew that if we had another referendum the result would be exactly the same. In fact if anything if there was movement in Wigan it was movement the other way where Remainers after the referendum just said look they won fair and square we've just got to move on. And I've never made any secret from my constituents that I want to remain. I still want to remain I still think it is a better option for Britain but there is no prospect of doing that because we had a referendum and that's why I spent I stuck my neck out. I nearly got thrown out of the Labour Party for doing it. Mm. But I, I campaigned for a deal and a soft Brexit that would keep those close political and economic ties to the EU. Because, to be honest with you, I didn't want to end up here. And I could see where this was going. And that was a hard thing to do because in Wigan I'm seen as a Romaniac who's trying to block Brexit. Whereas in the Westminster bubble I'm seen as a lever who's trying to drive the country off a cliff. And so I was having to go out and make that argument at different ends of the country against friends and family and neighbours and constituents. But I did it because it was the right thing to do. And in the end, I do think that is leadership. I think sometimes you have to do things especially because they're hard. And it can be a very lonely place, but it is the right thing to do and it's the important thing to do. Is politics as the art of the possible rather than the supply of idea ideals or, I, don't, I don't think that's right actually but I, I think you have to go out and you have to argue for the world as you want it to be and Labour's never been the party of the status quo we always seek to advance we always believe that things can be done the minimum wage is one of the best examples of that my predecessor Ian McCartney was the minister responsible and the way he tells it people said the sky would fall in it just could not be done and now when I talk to kids in Wigan they don't even realise that there was a time before the minimum wage you can change things, but you've got to win the argument. And the truth is that when we called that referendum, I didn't vote for it, but the Labour Party supported the idea of it. And when we called that referendum, we'd never made the argument. The first conversation that I'd had with my constituents about the EU was the week after David yeah. Cameron called that referendum. And we'd lost before we'd even started. That's the lesson. We've got to go out and argue for the world as we want it to be. And we've got to win that argument. Let's go to Gary now, who's in Coatbridge in, in North Lanarkshire. Gary, what would you like to ask Lisa and Andy? <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Um, Hello. Lisa, I'd like to just ask you about the comments that you made about com well, the comparison that you made between Catalonia and Scotland, mm -hmm. OK? And uh, talking about uh, the solution, apparently, that the Spanish state had for what you called divisive, divisive national nationalism. Mm -hmm. 
um, in Scotland. Now, to be quite honest with you, I found these comments really offensive mm-hmm. um, from the perspective that the Spanish state has used political violence, it has used political trials, and political leaders from Catalonia are now in exile Absolutely. because of the actions of the Spanish state. So why did you feel that that was an appropriate statement to make. So the short answer is that I didn't, and I didn't say that the Spanish state uh, had taken the right approach to Catalonia. The, the, the Spanish state that you're talking about is a right-wing Spanish government that's used violence against its own people and ought to be and has been rightly condemned for doing so. What I actually said w- before it was picked up and willfully distorted by the Scottish National Party was that... Um, in Scotland, we have not understood how to deal with populist nationalism. And that is a very particular issue that has arisen in Scotland that Labour, UK Labour in particular, has really struggled to understand and to deal with. And rather than turn inwards amongst ourselves and continue to argue about, uh, argue about factions, about resources, about leaders, we need to start looking outwards to the rest of the world, where in places like Quebec, um, at brief moments, there has been some success from socialists at advancing the cause of social justice justice and uh, defeating the cause of nationalism and separatism. Now, when I reference Catalonia, I reference the peaceful struggle that the Spanish socialists had waged in Catalonia in order to advance the cause of social justice and to resist the idea of nationalism as the answer to the problems that people face there. Of course I wasn't talking about using violence. Of course I wasn't endorsing the actions of the Spanish government. It is absolutely ridiculous to suggest that a Labour MP would do that and one of the things that happened very very quickly is that the Scottish National Party decided to seize on this in order to willfully distort those comments and it is something that we've seen them do over and over again is to exploit the politics of grievance in order to maintain the focus on the independence question and prevent us from from finding any way as a country to pull together and move forwards. So I mean you haven't used such bold terms but you're telling Gary he's been conned by the SNP. Absolutely, yeah, oh, absolutely. Right. You are using yeah. such bold terms. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> exact, that is exactly what happened. <clears throat> Gary, tell me and if you... You, if you look at the words that I used, because these were comments that I made on the Andrew Neil programme, yes. it's there. It's there in black and white. It's there for everybody to see. And they were picked up and willfully distorted in order, I think, to, to, um, to continue to maintain the focus on the independence question. I think that is honestly because the SNP don't want to talk about some of the problems that they're creating in Scotland. Um, Gary, Gary, were you expecting such a comprehensive answer? Um, it was probably the answer that I did expect, to be quite honest with you. So, so, so you, I mean, so you knew that these... That you, I wholeheartedly disagree with. Yes, but I mean, let's just focus on what's been said uh, in that yeah. interview, the bit that you're picking up on. Where did you get the sure. idea that Lisa Nandy was endorsing violence against protesters? I think any comparison to uh, Catalonia is very, very dangerous. What you've I'm gonna, I'm just, we are short of time. I'm just going to insist that you answer the question. Where, where sure. did you get the idea that she'd endorsed violence? Because I, 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 I don't follow Scottish politics as sure. closely as you do, sure. and, and I, I can't see where anyone would have got that idea from it unless sure. they were being spoon-fed okay. it by the SNP. Okay, so Spain currently has a socialist government that has been in place since 2018, June 2018, I think it was, it was elected. Since that point, there has been a number of political trials. Um, there okay, just final time, where did you where did you get the trial. idea that she was endorsing violence against protesters? So, listen, I never I said that. Okay, okay? good. Okay. What is the, I mean, the, the referendum took place in Catalonia in 2017 before the current socialist government uh, came to power in Spain. Okay. Um, however, that Spanish socialist government has continued the, per- the political persecution. I know, but Ga- Gary, yeah. but Gary, I was talking about the Spanish socialists in Catalonia and who are actually on course to do well in the forthcoming elections okay. because they've managed to peacefully advance the cause of social justice. And that, you know, I was absolutely clear in what I said on the Andrew Neil show. And I, I completely understand that these issues are incredibly sensitive, but that's why I was very careful about the language that I used. Mm. But I'm we not do, careful we do, enough. Lisa rewrites history. 
history live on LBC, says Angus. Um, this is just nonsense. You said these things, own them. Well, I did. I'm sorry, but I, you know, I would own them if I had said this them. Is why, but I didn't. This is why you're not on social media anymore, Angus. If you want to get back in touch with the quotes that you you are referring to, the quotes you would like Lisa and Andy to own, I will happily pass them on to her. Let's steer things back southwards now. Ranjit is in Oldbury in the West Midlands. Ranjit, what would you like to ask Lisa and Andy? Good morning, Lisa. Morning. If, if, if you, morning. If you win, is there a place for momentum in your party? So the the a lot of the people who joined the party in the last few years and got involved in some of the momentum campaigns are friends of mine, and they're people who, very like me actually, joined the Labour Party because they wanted to play a part in changing the world, and making it a better place to live in and because they don't accept the world as it is and ve- very like me actually they didn't just want to sign a petition to their MP or ask their MP to do something they've been involved in things like setting up energy co-ops and food banks and credit unions and housing cooperatives and clean energy schemes it's really there's some really exciting things that have happened in the Labour Party and for those people it's really important that they know that under my leadership they would not just be welcome but they would be valued where we've gone wrong in recent years I think is in the uh, sections of the party on both the right and the left who have been very very interested in attacking and fighting each other who think that the real enemy is other people within the party um, and who don't see themselves as labor they see themselves as a particular sort of labor and for those people whether they're on the left or on the right, they are killing us. Because if we're the sort of party that claims to go out and want a more compassionate, kinder, fairer society, we will never convince the public that that is true unless we can be decent to, and supportive towards one get, another. Can you get momentum and centrist dads to march alongside each yes. other in pursuit? Go, how? Well, I mean, the rancour here is quite incredible. And it's clear that the, the, the one wing of the party is more interested in controlling the Labour Party than it is in controlling the country. Because... Because actually we have. So in the last election campaign, I had people who would call themselves Momentum and Labour and people who would call themselves not Momentum and Labour coming out and campaigning together. And we've worked together on all sorts of issues over the last few years. And I think in every part of the country, that's also been the same. And I suppose what I would say is that this is about the culture of the Labour Party, really. People who want to get involved in order to be for something and pull together in order to achieve something... They are welcome and they are valued. And the challenge that we present to one another from left to right in this party is important. And all of those people need to know that they have a place. Those people who are just anti other people in the Labour Party, that is completely the wrong culture and that will kill us. And they, they need to they need to sort themselves out. Who's most anti you in the Labour Party? Um <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure anyone actually. I mean, I, you know, Come on. I, I mean, of course, a full and out. I mean, it's unprecedentedly years, I, fractious at the moment. Somebody like Jess Phillips takes astonishing amounts of abuse from um, people who are ostensibly on the same side of British politics. Keir Starmer seems to be trying to sort of ride both horses with a degree of success. Rebecca Long Bailey very firmly allied with the current leadership yeah. which has failed so abysmally who who, who, who i mean it, you'd said you come off social media so i'm not going to let you claim that you don't incite negativity and, and, sure. and rank up which part of the party does it come from the most i, I suppose I, the reason that i'm hesitating a bit i'm not yeah. trying to be sort of cagey about it i'm just really struggling to think i have friends in every wing of the party and every part of the movement and i you know i've been a member of the labor party for 25 years now I think and um, it's family to me and there are people that I'm really good mates with in Parliament who I don't really agree with at all about a lot of issues and that sort of seems to me to be our strength is that we are a very broad movement that's what gives us reach into the country and enables us to hear what people are saying in very different places and okay, from very I'll, different perspectives I'll rephrase yeah. slightly then what, what, what criticism most gets under your skin for its unfairness then well I, I think just like the, the caller from Scotland who you know and certainly the, the people that you've cited on Twitter Angus who are adamant that I'm saying things that I haven't said i mean i just i think we deserve to give each other more respect than that to be honest the the problem is clear actually because the quote we should look outwards to other countries where they've had to deal with divisive nationalism in places like catalonia you can argue very convincingly and and for what it's worth persuasively you have cut you have cut the end of that off though go on 
Well, because then I went on to talk about the Spanish socialists. I, I was, I was about to say that supports system. your cause, but but you know, selective clipping of quotes could right. also support the points that that were made by Angus. Let's let's move to Bradford. Kelly's there. Kelly, what would you like to ask Lisa and Andy? Hi. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to um, because obviously she said that she's come off social media. And um, when I heard that Lisa was coming on the show, I had a look at um, social labour social media groups. Yes. Um, which, as you can imagine, have a lot of hard lefters on. <laughs> yes. Um, and I wanted to kind of get the general feel for, for Lisa and Andy because, uh, um, admittedly, I haven't looked into uh, Lisa very much myself, but I just wanted to see what the general consensus was. And it seems that everybody seems to be calling her a blue Tory because of her voting record. None of them cited blue her... Lab- the- blue Labour. Blue Labour, yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's right. no, it's blue, just blue getting Tory worse. a bit more dog bites man than man yeah. bites dog, isn't it? Carry on. <laughs> About that. Well, we know that's fine, so, slip and crikey, um, we'll yeah. do it. I, I, I'll put that to her. I mean, wh- what does it mean? And just, is I, don't, it I, don't, I don't know. Kelly, I was just going to ask you what, what that does mean, actually. I haven't come off social media, by the way. I just don't have it enough. on my phone. It means but... you're not left wing enough. Um, um, they kept citing your voting record. So I went on to look at your voting record because um, people kept saying the words voting record but not really explaining it very much. <laughs> so as not. I went down your voting record, I was actually, I felt that you were aligned very much with Labour policies yeah. until it got to things like income tax, capital gains tax, um, bankers' bonuses. And it seems that everybody is fixated on those specific elements, those specific things. Um, and so, that's why so, uh, you're being labelled as a blue Tory, but there are thousands of people Labour. on these groups. Blue well, Labour, honestly. So I, so I, I, the only, the only time that I've rebelled in recent years against the Labour Party line under Jeremy Corbyn was when we were supporting cutting taxes for the wealthy. And I thought that was the wrong priority for the country. So my record on that is probably to the left of of Jeremy, to be honest, in recent years. Um, And I came into Parliament after a decade working in the voluntary sector where I was working with children in immigration detention, uh, taking the last Labour government to court over their treatment of migrant families, uh, working with homeless teenagers on the streets of Soho. I just I think this is a willful bit of mischief, to be honest. Nobody in the Labour Party is a Tory and we've got to get away from these daft labels. We only harm ourselves if we do it. I'm someone who came into Parliament out of frustration with the lack of radicalism under the last government, even as I recognised the enormous achievements and important investment that had happened under that government. And I just, I really don't, I, I just really don't recognise it. It's it, We're only harming ourselves when we do this. We've got to pull together and work out how we deliver the radical change that this country needs in a country that is very, very decent but instinctively cautious, how we're going to earn the trust of people to do that. Um, you, you also, before you went into Parliament and since, have been a, a, a fairly outspoken champion of the Palestinian cause. So um, I wonder whether you've had the chance yet to cast an eye over Jared Kushner's solution to the thorniest problem in world politics. I mean, I'm horrified by it, to be honest. I'm horrified by it because I've spent seven years as the vice chair and then chair of Labour Friends of Palestine in the Middle East trying watching the situation get worse for the Palestinian people and what this does is potentially close off any prospect of a two-state solution and that is devastating for Israel as well and the reckless way in which this administration has approached this issue this has surely got to be the time when the UK government finally finds its teeth and stands up and says enough is enough I mean I saw a comment from Dominic Raab this morning where he suggested that this was an interesting plan that needed to be taken seriously that is disgraceful as the uk government we have a history in the middle east we had we had a role to play in creating these problems in the first place and to not stand up now when we can see the implications of what the trump administration is doing is really really disgraceful britain has got to find its voice again staying um allied to matters middle eastern you blamed a failure of leadership for the party's crisis over anti-semitism you you know that a lot of the votes you're seeking are in the pockets of people who still insist that there was no crisis of anti-semitism my, my um social media is full of people claiming it was smears it was media bias there was never any anti-semitism it was it, it was used as a stick with which to beat the dear leader and there was no evidence whatsoever for it and then i bumped into luciana burger the other day at yeah. the Amfran trust lunch and 
I mean, even the most cursory glance of what she went through makes a complete mockery of these claims, and yet still they come. Yeah, so I'm not seeking the votes of people who think that there was no problem with anti-Semitism because there was, and I spoke out about this when I was in the Shadow Cabinet. It was the only time I broke the collective line because I considered that not to do so would have made me complicit in it. I, I suppose what I would say is this, is that for a lot of our members it's very unless they're online and on on yeah. social media they may never have seen incidents of anti-semitism in the labor party and that is because my members have gone out and fought racism over and over again over recent decades but we allowed a series of very high profile incidents of anti-semitism to go unchallenged and unaddressed and by doing so the leadership of the party collectively allowed a green light to go out to anti-semites so that they had a natural home in labor now that you know i've said that this is incredibly shameful and we should have been Why much more vocal it? and we should have we should have dealt with it i don't know oh, is the honest... you're a lot no, closer I... to the action than we are oh, well, how, I... how, how did it happen I, I left the shadow cabinet in 2016 yes. I, d I genuinely don't know what went wrong i've spoken to shadow cabinet members since who say they don't know why those cases were unaddressed whether it was willful or whether it was chaos I have no idea, but what I do know is the damage that has done will last with Labour for a very long time. And you mentioned Luciana. I have other friends, Ruth Smith yes. and Louise Elman, who were dealing with this at the time. And I remember sitting in the committee room where they were begging the leadership of the party to adopt an internationally recognised definition of anti-Semitism and looking up at the shadow cabinet and seeing people sitting there while they told Jewish Labour MPs that the shadow cabinet knew better than they did about what constituted anti-Semitism. We should never be there again. And that, that, that is why I've been so robust about it, because there is no alternative. The damage that we've done is enormous not just to jewish labor members but to jewish people in this country and we've got to own up to that and we've got to change lisa and andy many thanks indeed thank you you've been listening to james o'brien on lbc actually you've been listening to lisa and andy i've just been <laughs> doing the irritating interruptions time now for the headlines with simon conway british, british airways has suspended all flights to and from mainland china due to the coronavirus outbreak the airline which operates daily services to shanghai and beijing from heathrow says the safety of its customers and crew is its priority the Grenfell Tower inquiry has heard witnesses involved in the block's refurbishment are applying to protect themselves from the prospect of prosecution. Key individuals who designed...